Hello everyone and welcome to the next uh, isolation talk. This evening uh, we have Ian Moore from Ian Moore Architects coming to talk to us today about four houses, uh, which is really an amazing pleasure to have Ian here to talk to us. He's one of my favourite architects um, based in Sydney, um, so we completely love having you here Ian, thank you very much. Um, and I'm having some trouble seeing Ian now, which is really annoying because we were seeing you just a second ago. So maybe we'll just talk, Ian, and uh, we'll have one of your buildings up until we can sort out what's going on. How are you, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you, Adam. How's, your, um, how's life in your office? <laughs> Sorry? How's life in your office? Life in the office is very quiet, apart from the radio. Yes. Uh, no team around me. But um, I am getting a lot done, I have to oh, say. Awesome, awesome, it's an awesome. uh, isolation environment that we're currently in. Yes. Um, and I am just having a bit of a problem finding you, actually, and your slides. Do you want to transition to your slides and we'll just um, see whether they're coming up or whether it's just actually something wrong with Microsoft Teams? We might have to hang up again and come back into it. Sorry to everyone out there listening. Uh, had a few technical issues today. We've solved the acoustic problems that we had. We haven't solved sometimes teams is a bit testy um and i might get you just to hang up and come back into this again because uh for some reason this is not picking up um the fact we've got the program open okay okay sorry everybody um i met ian years ago when i first moved to sydney and uh Actually, I think it was about the time that he had just finished the Altair and we were um, potentially working with similar clients. Just let Ian into this. Apologies everyone, I'm just going to go quiet for a little while, so hang slack for me.
Hello everybody, sorry about that. Um, a few technical glitches which we've just solved, um, which is very fantastic. Uh, so I'm just about to transition over to Ian, but I, as I was saying, one of the things that we thought were, was fantastic about Ian when I first met him was uh, he had just finished the Altair in Darlinghurst and it's probably one of the most fantastic multi-residential buildings in Sydney. Uh, still, I think, one of the most fantastic buildings. And since then, I think uh, Ian has shown an absolute ability to uh, deliver buildings of the purest form, uh, the, the level of finish, the level of um, the level of rigor in his planning, the level of rigor in his facades, the level of rigor in the way in which the building is presented is just absolutely out of his world. He's also a person who I love because he's not afraid to use color, which anyone who knows me will know I'm not afraid to lose color, <laughs> use color. Um, so really asking Ian to come along and speak was a, was a no-brainer. So Ian, thank you very much, and I'll just hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Adam. Good evening, everyone, wherever you might be tonight. Uh, firstly, uh, I would like to thank Adam very much, not only for the invitation to give this talk, but for actually coming up with the whole concept of this talks program while we're all in some form of isolation. And in addition to that, for having opened the Architects Bookshop um, and even better still in our local neighbourhood of Surrey Hills. So um, a very big thank you, Adam, from myself and I know the rest of the architectural community in Sydney. Um, we love what you're doing. Keep it up. Um, I would also like to say a special hello to my team who um, are all working from home, uh, to Danny and Dubbo, to Rothio and her Spanish contingent in Bondi and Madrid, to Maria, who now lives in London. Uh, she and her friends and some of her colleagues from over there are watching. Maria was the project architect for the River House, which you'll see shortly, and also to Emily, who uh, was part of my team previously, and she was the project architect on uh, the Redfern Warehouse. So um, hopefully, whoops, what's happened? Have you still got me there, Adam? I can't see anything anymore. Yes, we've still got you there. Okay, where have I, where's my talk gone? <laughs> uh, where's your shared window? Can you, we can see, we can see that it's now gone. Um, um, maybe if you, do you want to jump out of, out of it again? Out of share, sharing the screen? Oh, we can see you now, which is quite of nice. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. welcome. Um, thank you. I'll just see if I can. Um, okay, I don't know what happened there. Wait a um, how's that? Is that back to how it should be? Not yet, but that's okay. It'll take a little bit of time. Uh, have you shared your screen? Um, I thought I did. Try that again. Yes. Can't seem to find. Um, can't find where you've gone, and there you are. Okay. Hmm. And we can now see it, except that it's incredibly um, thin. So, <laughs> um, do you want to just? do what you were doing and just share the screen and I will and and I'll, I'll then have to change some settings here to I think to make it work properly. Okay. Um, apologies, everybody. I'm just going to try on this again. So sorry about this. Ah, oh, here we go. There we go, Ian. We're back. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. 
um, to all of my team. I promise it wasn't me that messed up the technology. Um, okay, four houses. Uh, very simple uh, talk tonight about four of my houses uh, in and around Sydney. Uh, one of them suburban, one urban, one at the beach, and one in the mountains. Um, McLeod House is a house in Castle Cove, a suburb of Sydney, so this is our suburban house. It is um, a house that was first completed in 1997. Um, well, the design was complete in 97, I should say. The first um, stage of the building work was complete in 2003, and the last stage was completed in 2015. And uh, we're hoping this year to actually finally finish the swimming pool, which should be the last stage. So it's a project that keeps giving. A uh, wonderful client who comes back every five years gets me to do a little bit more to it. And um, it's really about these two very famous houses in LA. It's, um, I suppose, my homage to these two houses, which I've always loved. I think most people would um, know that I'm a big fan of the Case Study House program. Um, in LA and the Hunt House at Malibu uh, has always been one of my favorites and I have to say in my opinion the, the two most beautiful garages ever built. Um, the Style House uh, by Pia Koenig has the um, iconic view uh, looking out over LA and when I first went to the site in Castle Cove sitting on top of a ridge uh, with an incredible view out over the northwest of Sydney towards Chatswood, I immediately thought of this house. And um, then when we got to start planning it, the thing that is um, really important about a lot of these houses in, in the suburbs is that you only really get to them by car and that the car is in fact celebrated and, and you don't walk into these houses, typically you drive into them. So that's why that image of the Hunt House at Malibu was so important to me. Um, in looking at the, the plan of, of this house, it's actually an alteration in addition to an existing house uh, that was built in the 1970s. And you can see the sort of grey shaded area of the um, the plan here, uh, which is the a bit that we kept, we had to keep 30% of the original house in order to keep the same floor area and the same height and the same boundary setbacks as the existing house because the planning controls had changed through the years. And if we had uh, worked with the new controls, the house would have been uh, much, much smaller um, than what we're able to do by keeping that 30%. And you can see the old double garage door here and the cars used to drive in here and you used to actually walk along and enter the house around about here somewhere at the um, uh, the turn um, in the L shape um, but we did things slightly differently but this lower level it's really about um, sort of guest accommodation the family room that opens out onto the pool terrace that's the pool that hasn't yet been built, but hopefully be completed this year. A little gymnasium down at the bottom that we excavated uh, about um, 10 years ago as one of the many stages of the project. And then here we have the upper level plan and you'll see quite clearly here that the twin garages and the entry between them a long corridor with a series of rooms opening off each side and then coming into the main body of the house, which is essentially an open glazed pavilion, which looks at the quite spectacular view. Um, show the elevations more because I just like these drawings and, uh, you know, Adam talks about the rigor in my work. Well, you know, I do love um, working very hard to achieve that sort of rigorous outcome in terms of both plan elevation and, and particularly in section. Um, so these drawings really just um, hopefully reflect that. Uh, on this elevation here, what you do see is the little sawtooth roof, which is over the, the bedroom wing, the entry wing to the house and the corridors in between them. And that allows uh, winter sunlight to come to the bedrooms, which are on the southern side of the house. And you'll see the site falls away very quickly and in this elevation falls away very sharply to a cliff um, out to the west. 
Um, the other thing about this, uh, in terms of the height of the building, we were so uh, tightly restricted in terms of well, what we could achieve because of the land falling away so quickly that we only have 2.4 meter high ceilings. And uh, while typically now we have to have a minimum of 2.7, the 2.4 creates a beautiful horizontality in this house, which you'll see in a moment. And I think uh, it was quite important to that thinking in particularly in relation to the style house and that very horizontal view out really to the horizon um, and everything in between. Um, the section down through the main corridor is also important because it shows um, some large panels, uh, which you'll see in a moment. Um, this is not about cellular spaces with um, small doors. This is actually about an open plan house um, with sliding walls. Uh, the house sitting in its context, uh, surrounding buildings were all developed in, 19, in the 1970s. You can see the old pool that's still hanging on, but about to be demolished and replaced with the new one down in this area here. But this was the sort of quality of the houses uh, that was here as well. It was sort of pretty much looked like this guy here. Um, so we've basically given a bit of an update in that little triangle of white painted masonry in there. That's the original part of the house that was maintained. And here's my reference to the Hunt House at Malibu, the two garages, the entry between them, and then you get the big view to Chatswood in the distance, not dissimilar to the, the style house. Maybe not quite as iconic a view as the one over LA, but um, still a pretty significant view. The other thing I need to say about my client is that he is a collector of all things Philippe Stark, uh, which people ne wouldn't necessarily associate with me. Um, but he's such a great client. And uh, one of the better things that Philippe Stark has ever designed is this little Aprilia motorcycle, which he um, has proudly parked in one of the garages. And uh, before we even started the design of this house, he told me all of the pieces that he had collected, um, including taps, light fittings, door handles, even a toilet suite and a bath that uh, he wanted me to use in the house. So that central corridor with that idea that it is not um, a dark, narrow corridor with small doors opening into cellular spaces. It's about these big sliding screens so that you're borrowing not only the space of the rooms on either side of the corridor, but you're actually allowing that light to come in and it becomes quite a luminous space as you move through it. And one of the kids' bedrooms on the southern side, and you can see the rake of the ceiling there going up to a high level clear story window, which um, in winter they can allow deep penetration of um, sunlight right through to the windows on the other side. Um, on the other side from that, the ensuite of the main bedroom where we've got a little curved ceiling tucked up into that um, high level window. And then the main bathroom and you can see very clearly here how the, the rooms on either side of that corridor form a much larger space as you move through it if these panels are in the open position. And then the staircase uh, again, which should have been a dark space top lit. So it becomes a very, very luminous space, almost like the the end of this pathway leading you through to the main part of the house. Um, similarly, as you're coming back up from the lower level, you're really drawn up by this um, incredibly luminous ceiling above you. Um, the TV room without a TV and then the main space. So as I said before, that um, cluster of towers in the distance for those of you who know Sydney or live in Sydney that is Chatswood so it's like the third or fourth sort of cluster of big buildings in Sydney up on the um, North Shore and you really look out over the roofs of all of the surrounding houses um, to that distant view and you can see the very low ceiling height at 2400 but because of the expansive nature of the view it actually feels very comfortable. Looking back the other way, the other thing about it is also this idea, which is common in many, many of my projects, is to really dissolve that boundary between 
the interior and the exterior spaces so that terraces, balconies, courtyards really become part of the inner space just to create big, big open spaces, uh, which we can do very well in our very benign climate in Sydney. Um, and then looking back to the bedroom wing and the garages and the front entry, um, you can see some of the uh, sandstone outcrops which occur all over the site that we're sitting on top of. Uh, the louvers for privacy and sun control from the northern sun. And looking back in the other direction, you can see that lower level family room that opens out to the pool terrace. So that was my little homage to the LA case study houses. And then we moved to the beach. Um, Jeroa is um, a beach about two hours drive south of Sydney on the south coast. It is um, at the northern end of Seven Mile Beach. And it has a river called the Crooked River that runs into the northern end of the beach. So while this is at the beach, it doesn't actually look at the beach, it looks at the river. And the river is over here to the south. And um, it's a great view. This is the, the southern boundary of the site is actually a six meter high cliff that falls down to a public reserve on the edge of the river. Street is over on the northern side, so the sunlight's at the street end, the view's at the southern end. So it's that typical problem, you know, where the view and the sun are at opposing ends of the site. Uh, on this lower level, uh, my client wanted a self-contained apartment so that she could let it as a holiday rental. And when uh, she had large groups of family and friends, staying this door at the bottom of the stairs could be opened up and the whole house could be used as one. There's a separate entry coming down here so that when it's a holiday rental, they just make their way down and they have the backyard to themselves. Whereas on the main level, um, the front courtyard really is part of this living space, street out on the northern side here. And the view to the south, as I said, captured from this deck. Um, so that dichotomy between you know, the sun, the view, how we deal with those, uh, really the concept here was to make a linear living space that runs from north to south and links both the courtyard and the deck, the sun and the view. Um, there's a little trick to it in section you'll see in a moment. The other thing that was important was this is a, an economical house. It's a beach house, holiday house. So, and I also wanted to use no structural steel in the building, it is all timber construction. So to reduce the spans to something that were uh, able to be achieved with standard sort of off the shelf LVL joists, we introduced uh, a thick wall running down the spine through the center of the house to allow us to span onto those to keep these open spaces on either side and then utilised that thick wall for kitchens, for storage, wardrobes, even the barbecue and the downpipes from the big gutter integrated into it there. Um, the section is probably the most informative and uh, it shows the roof being angled up so that the winter sunlight actually comes right down into the living area towards the southern end and then a secondary pop-up roof which is actually at the angle of the winter sun, allows the winter sun to actually come out and completely uh, cover the rear deck in sunlight, even though it's at the southern end of the house. Looking at it from the public reserve down below, uh, it's all clad in tallow wood, which um, I haven't been down there for a couple of years, but I'm hoping that by now it's a nice silver grey and it'll really tie in with the uh, windows and doors and the roofing. Uh, so it was always envisaged as a sort of silvery grey building eventually. But you can see here in this view how the living space is just one great long tube of space that runs right through to that very important view out over the river and the National Park of Seven Mile Beach beyond and uh, the idea that you sort of arrive and have a separate front door from the cars. Um, and again, that will hopefully be a nice silvery grey facade by now. And then from the backyard, very simple construction, but as I say, all timber and 
everything uh, used to connect it is uh, marine grade stainless steel. So all the bolts and um, gusset plates and everything else all one six stainless steel. And then probably the big uh, move is very apparent here in, in two respects. One is the pop-up roof over the living area where you can really see that sunlight coming down and going right through to the deck at the southern end. But I suppose the most dominant thing here is the colour. Adam said that I wasn't afraid of using colour and I'm certainly not. But when I do use it, I like to really control how it's used. And um, this really came about by suggesting to my client that she needed a really comfortable, uh, relaxed sofa that she could um, really sink into um, and enjoy being at a beach house. So it wasn't too formal. And I said the Togo lounge was absolutely the ideal sofa and I really wanted it in orange. And I wasn't sure how she would cope with that, but um, she loved it and said, well, why are we stopping there? What else could we have in here in colour? And I said, well, we may as well, you know, make the kitchen colour because everything else is really about the view. You can see there's so much greenery out there that by introducing the orange, we could still um, really use that to contrast with the natural um, green of the trees outside. Um, in terms of the other materials inside, it's very simple, obviously white plasterboard, but the floors are not concrete. They may appear to be concrete, but they're actually grey cork, which is a material I use a lot, 100% natural, environmentally friendly cork. Uh, there's a side window, and if you actually look very closely between those trees, you could see the ocean out through there. So that's the beaches out in that direction, but you don't really see it because of the trees on the neighbouring property and the public reserve. Um, the kitchen, uh, it was a bit of fun, you know, um, and I think when I introduced the colour, it's really about saying here's an object which is not part of the structural system of the building. It's uh, an element which almost reads as a piece of furniture within the space. Um, you could almost argue that it's a sort of de facto artwork on the wall of the space. And then this image is my homage to the original 1970s advertising campaign for the Togo Lounge. And if, for those of you who have seen that, you will know that this image is virtually identical, except that it was shot in Palm Springs. And instead of the trees outside, you actually saw the mountains um, surrounding Palm Springs. Um, but in all other respects, we've been uh, pretty faithful to that original advertising campaign. Um, the deck, which is really what it was all about for my client, um, she was adamant that despite it being on the south side, this was where she was going to spend all her time. She had no interest in the northern courtyard. She said it was adjacent to the road, and so she had never spent time out there. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that'll be the case once the hedge and the trees at the front are fully grown. She'll be spending a lot of time in winter out the front, but this is really what it was about for her, and in particular, this view down to the river. So that's why it's known as the River House. Um, then also you can see the, the sort of thick spine running through the centre here, which integrates the barbecue. And then from the bedroom, this is what, again, the view that she really wanted from her bedroom was of the river. And what we did was we um, helped really um, give both people, no matter what side of the bed you're on, that same view by mirroring the wall at the other end of the bedroom. You can also just make out that other pop-up roof over the bedroom, bringing in that northern sunlight as well. And then into the sort of most luxurious um, part of the house in terms of materials, the bathrooms. We used actually a very cost-effective marble tile, which was actually made from all the offcuts in the marble quarries and, uh, and from making other marble slabs. So it wasn't actually all that expensive. And it's about making things that are very durable, that are timeless. And I think that's what my architecture is really about. And this bathroom hopefully is, is a bathroom that is hard to actually date um, and it will be very, very durable and serviceable for its entire life. Then when you go down the stairs, you get to the lower self-contained part of the um, house, which is relatively simple. Um, it's uh, very simple in terms of colour as well. It's just white and grey, so no, no bold colour down here. And then moving into our um, urban house, 
And this is a large warehouse in the inner city suburb of um, Redfern. It's a warehouse I've known for many, many years, going back probably to the very early 90s, even late 80s. Um, I was aware of this warehouse, always loved it. And um, I had actually done a, a scheme for it previously when it had been for sale once before. And my clients um, bought it and uh, decided to have a competition. And there were three architects invited and uh, we were lucky enough to win with a very simple concept. And really it was all about respecting this original building, um, adaptively reusing it, changing it as little as possible and letting the building itself uh, really tell us what to do with it. So this is the finished building, not, not before. Um, we've reinstated um, windows in the original openings and where we did remove windows, um, well, we didn't, we removed some windows that had been put in in old roller door openings. We actually reopened them up to make big openings and then put new windows and then we put sun control louvers over them, which when closed actually mimicked the original roller shutters. So it was a really case of trying to put the building back the way it originally was. And internally, it was built as a double height volume. It never had an intermediate floor until 1993 when a previous renovation had. So uh, we actually had to take that floor out because we had a major seismic upgrade for the building and incorporate a totally new steel frame. But it was really about this beautiful quality that the space had with these very large timber trusses spanning 15 meters. Uh, a lot of natural light coming in from around the perimeter, but not a great deal in the center. It's quite dark. And looking the other way, this is just after we took the roof off the northern end to create one of our two outdoor rooms, which you'll see shortly. So conceptually, very simple, letting the, the trusses dictate the breakup of the planning putting the living spaces to the north, creating a, an outdoor room as a terrace inside the um, building shell to the north, creating a large internal courtyard on the eastern side, bedrooms across the southern side so they could take advantage of the windows to the street, and then the bathrooms to the western side where it gets very hot in the afternoon because of the afternoon sun on the brickwork re-radiating into the interior. And then that Internal courtyard really becomes the lungs for the building. It allows the natural ventilation to work extremely well. And it also provides views from what would have been internal spaces now to an outdoor space. And even views from the main bedroom and the living spaces to the sky. In terms of the plan, uh, one of the most important aspects of my brief was to provide a garage for approximately 10 cars. Um, so there's some car stackers which house eight classic sports cars, uh, a couple of, you know, day to day uh, family vehicles, full equipment room, the workshop for the cars, bin room, courtyard with a small swimming pool, uh, self contained guest accommodation entry hall and then this is a home office for one of my clients. Uh, it's an equine genetic laboratory. Uh, very unusual thing to design. Um, but what we really did was put all of these ancillary spaces on the lower level. The upper level is in effect a single level house. So starting with a 915 square meter building by cutting the holes in it, we got it down to about 756 square meters. And then the house itself is basically half of that. So um, it's it's still a, a reasonable sized house. There's no question about that. But it's um, but when you think about it being around about the 350, 360 square meters, it's not um, overly large for a four bedroom house. And it's really, they live on this level and they only go down that big yellow stair when they're either going to work or leaving the house. Um, 
In terms of section, we're actually dealing with a space which is in effect three stories in height when you come into the main entry hall. Uh, it's a large scale building and so a lot of the work we did was about dealing with that scale and emphasising the scale. Uh, so from the street front, the other benefit was that the building always had two addresses. Um, so we've used one for the front door for the house and the other address is for the front door for the laboratory, which is next door. And it was very important for my client to be able to leave home in the morning before going to work. She just walks out the front door of the house, turns around and goes back in the door of the lab. But it, it effectively separates the two, which is really important to her. And the lab is inside those large windows. Um, to the and here's the laboratory. And uh, it's actually the perfect work environment for coronavirus. These are glass screens which prevent cross contamination between the workstations. So perfect for sort of isolating yourself with a glass screen from your co worker next to you. So uh, we knew this, this was coming, so we got ready for it. Um, the other thing that's really important about this space is because it's a home office and not a commercial space, it doesn't have to be fire rated from the main house. So we're able to have a translucent glass wall between the house and the office so that we're borrowing the light from the house side where the big courtyard is, letting light come into the laboratory. On the other side of the wall, you can see the wall on the left hand side that we were just looking at. And then the big new courtyard, which has been cut into uh, the center of the warehouse. And the other thing that was um, quite important about this was that uh, we weren't allowed to excavate below ground level. Uh, council were convinced it was a contaminated site, which it wasn't. Um, but we, we didn't mind this idea of building the courtyard and, uh, at a slightly elevated level. And this is actually the depth of the swimming pool as well. So the pool sits above the original ground level. So you access that courtyard off the half landing of the stair. This is the courtyard looking south and that's um, sun screening is to the bedroom and the guest room. Um, and then looking north towards the living spaces. The other two important things about the brief from my clients, um, they really didn't want to have um, a, a building that was um, a warehouse and then turn it into a house. In fact, they wanted it still to feel like a warehouse and they wanted the materials to be economical, tough, um, sort of off the shelf materials that could have existed within this um, sort of industrial commercial building before they came along. So it was about retaining that uh, industrial quality to the building. And then the uh, idea that you don't break this building up, you still want to see that volume, that original warehouse that you saw in those first couple of uh, photos. So we created a horizontal datum, which was at the underside of the, the bottom cord of the trusses and all solid walls stop at that point so that everything above that is actually clear glazing so that we can see the continuation of the trusses and we can actually, from one end of the, the building to the other, we can see the ceiling so that we can see the full extent of the space. And you also see in the shot that every time you're moving through the space, you're actually looking into that internal court. Um, the other materials that we introduced are the, the, the baby sort of corrugated, corrugated uh, iron ceilings, which is perforated um, in most of the spaces, not perforated in the, the bathrooms. Um, you can see that horizontal datum at the, the truss line. Uh, again, the grey cork on the floors. Yeah. And again, this uh, even the ensuite in the main bedroom follows that same principle of the clear glazing at the top. So from within that ensuite, you can actually look out through the clear glazing, through the windows of the bedroom, through the courtyard, and you can see the northern sky. And then looking back from the bedrooms towards the living spaces, the stair, which was the other thing that we really had a bit of fun with. My clients, um, like myself, are not scared of colour. Their favourite colour is orange. Um, mine, I suppose you would say is yellow. Um, we had to have uh, safety nosings on the stair. 
there was a, a fantastic international safety yellow nosing, which we were going to use with the grey lino. And then I just thought, well, the lino, the sorry, the cork actually came in the same safety yellow as the nosing. So we thought it was too good an opportunity to waste. So I said to my clients, how about it? And they said, why not? So that's why we have that yellow stair, a bit of fun. Um, and then this is really where you get the majority of the color comes into the living spaces. Um, it's about scale, it's about texture. So we've revealed by taking off many, many layers of paint, the original brickwork, this is the best we could do in terms of removing the paint, but you can see that patina of the original brick walls and my clients were very keen to leave that in its original condition. Uh, then everything that's new is nice and sharp and clean and white and then all the steel work in the floor all painted grey or grey cork and then the furniture was the really the element that we introduced the colour in. So uh, it's also an enormously large space for a living room. So you can't just put a normal sized piece of furniture into it. So this is, you know, extra soft by Living Devani, Piero Lasoni's beautiful modular sofa system. And you can do really great things like having parts of it facing different directions so that you can sit on part of that sofa and talk to people while they're preparing dinner in the kitchen, or you can be on the other side watching TV or listening to music. And what's really great is the kids actually come flying down the corridor and use this open corner to actually do forward rolls onto the sofa. Um, so, you know, little unexpected things. I didn't know that by designing that open corner that was what was going to happen, but inevitably things like that do happen and they're, they're welcomed. Um, and you can see from this living area how important that central courtyard becomes, not only from the terms of natural light and ventilation, but you get an outlook into it. You start to see the palm tree growing up, which eventually will be uh, very much in the middle of that view. And then looking back towards the kitchen space, and again, everything's overscaled. There's a seven metre long kitchen bench, which um, any shorter and it would have looked a bit silly. Uh, and then looking back from that space into the courtyard, looking at those big timber trusses. Um, and, you know, it's hard working with a building um, which wasn't meant to be quite so refined. And uh, that's part of the challenge and part of the excitement of working with these things. You've got to deal with things where each truss is actually quite distinct from the one next to each other. They have different bows and twists. They have different levels, nothing was particularly precise when it was put together. And so we, we felt that even though it looks as though what we've done is exceptionally precise, and to a large degree it is, but it still had sufficient tolerance to be able to deal with the existing conditions of a building of this nature. Um, and also the extra space within a building like this allows you to have multiple areas in which to sit. You can do different things. Um, this is just a nice space to sit and watch the kids actually swimming in the pool or just to contemplate the courtyard and the sky. While in the other direction, out on the northern end, where we've taken the roof off completely to create this outdoor room, uh, it was really about letting the sun come in to the living spaces, really enjoying an outdoor space, even though you're elevated above the street. And even to the extent where my clients were uh, very keen to have real grass on that terrace, both for the kids to play on and also for the dog, so that is a 300 millimetre deep mixture of fly ash and soil to take real grass. Um, and then introducing the landscaping so it really sort of softens it. And then again, that contrast between the, the organic um, nature of the landscape, the precision of the new steel and aluminium structure, and then the texture of the old brickwork. So all those elements are working together to create, I think, a pretty harmonious outcome. Um, and then looking back and you really get a sense of the scale of the space. Um, you see the internal courtyard, you really get a sense even of the main bedroom, which is beyond that again. So that idea again that you read what was this big open warehouse, you still have the ability to read it from one end to the other. And the threshold between inside and outside again dissolving just as the, the house in, in Castle Cove, um, that idea that they are one in the same space and you only close it when you absolutely have to. 
And then this space, the garage, and really I have to say this is where it all began because my client had searched for six years for a warehouse in which he could bring his collection of cars together in one place. And so we had a little bit of fun creating a, a garage that was, you know, very crisp and clean like a Formula One pit, um, great little car stackers. We had 10 millimetres to spare when we got these things in. Uh, it was perfect fit. Luckily, they're all Porsches, so they're quite low. Um, and the contrast between the sort of technology of the car and the sort of precision, precision of the new bits, but a little bit of, you know, um, the unexpected in the concrete where we had um, some of the formwork we've actually leached the, um, the black from the form ply into the concrete, which, you know, I know Ando wouldn't have accepted it, but, um, you know, we found that to be actually quite a nice thing to have that little sort of bit of a, um, a mark of the construction and not being totally perfect, but sitting contrasting just like the original brickwork with the precision of the new steel and aluminium, you get this little bit of imperfection. And lastly, uh, wanting to go up into the mountains. So those of you who know Sydney will um, no doubt know the Blue Mountains. Uh, Mount Wilson is right up at the northern end of um, the Blue Mountains. And uh, my client's brief to me, he showed me a picture of the Farnsworth house. He said, if I want one of these, but because it's up in um, the mountains and it's a, it's a rural site, I, I think we've got to somehow pay homage to the uh, corrugated iron sheds and the farm buildings um, around there. So he said, if you can marry the two together, that would be my ideal holiday house. So that was the starting point for the development of this house. Um, it's right at the end of the road from Mount Wilson. Can't go any further north than this. Um, our site is the yellow bit, obviously. It's 11.2 hectares the majority of which is um, uh, eucalypt forest, which is in a sense part of the Blue Mountains National Park. It's completely surrounded by the Blue Mountains National Park. And um, the interesting thing is I look at the subdivision plan and, and every time I look at it, I have a bit of a chuckle because I just think, what were they thinking? I have absolutely no idea how you come up with a subdivision plan that looks like that because there are no features that make any sense of that shape um, but that's what we've ended up with anyway um, so here's our little uh, house down here and north up the page the contour is running to the northeast and the view is actually down the valley here to the northwest so the rest of it is completely covered in beautiful eucalypt forest there's a Another neighbouring building down here, which is, has got a reason to be clearing and there are other small little pockets development, but they're all very close to the road. So this is um, the location of the, the house very close to the road. It started as a single pavilion um, with a later addition of a small guest pavilion and a swimming pool. And the swimming pool was really um, part of a, a requirement for firefighting, um, as well as obviously the clients, you know, thinking it wasn't a bad idea, but uh, we've got a bushfire attack level of 40, which is um, the second highest. Um, the council wanted to put us in the flame zone and we had to fight very hard with them to get Bell 40 to be accepted and we can achieve Bell 40 uh, quite easily with a steel frame structure and steel clad structure which is what we were always intending. So we managed to uh, get them to agree to that, but only after the tragic bushfires of earlier this year. Up until those fires happened, they were adamant they wanted us to be in the flame zone, but after those fires, they reconsidered and they felt that people perhaps shouldn't be creating concrete bunkers to live in and that Bell 40 was a more reasonable outcome. Um, so we do have to clear 30 odd trees um, to the northwest, which is where the fire would come up the valley, uh, which, you know, obviously um, enhances the view for my clients. Um, and when you've got a site with over 1,500 trees on it, the loss of 30 trees was deemed to be reasonable. In terms of the plan, it's a very modest 
two bedroom, 90 square meter house. Um, the Farnsworth House uh, reference has been very loosely translated in this um, plan. It, it's very rigorous again, the two bedrooms, a, a central pod containing the bathroom, kitchen and laundry, and then an open plan living space, primarily focused to the northwest where the view is. And then two big water tanks, one dedicated for firefighting, the other one for drinking water. And really this is uh, what the house is all about, this elevation. And the house is about providing shade and weather protection and collecting water. So the form of the building is about those two things. It's about this big roof that's draped over the top of a very simple regular steel frame and it just lets the water run down the hill to the big tanks at the southern end. The northern end, we have this uh, 3.6 metre cantilevered roof, which really is, is like a big cloak that's been thrown over the top of a frame, providing this very shaded northern uh, terrace. The other thing that we had to do, um, my clients didn't want handrails. They didn't want to be up off the ground. They wanted to be able to just step off the house onto the ground. And the fire requirements wouldn't allow us to have an open undercroft if it were elevated. So what we did is simple balanced cut and fill, uh, take a little bit out uh, on the entry side, push it down the hill a little bit to form the other side of the platform. So no material actually leaves the site. There's very little um, change to the natural state of affairs on the site because of that. And then on the, the western elevation, which is um, obviously taking in that big view down the valley to the northwest, it's quite significantly shaded because there's an enormous number of gum trees right in front of it, but um, and it has the overhanging roof. Southern end is really all about the water tanks and providing protection from that the southern winds in winter, solar panels on the roof. So it's effectively a self-contained um, off-grid building sitting up in the mountains. Uh, section very simple and I think the most important section is this one because it's about hierarchy of space. The most important space is the terrace on the northern end where you've got a, essentially a double height space with this big overhanging cantilevered roof. The living spaces again have this larger volume and it's tapering away so the bedrooms are probably the uh, more intimate spaces at the southern end under the lowest part of the roof. And then this is uh, what it will hopefully look like um, in about a year's time when we finish construction. So it's just about to start now. And, and just the, there's one last little bit of this talk and I just want to show the mini me that came afterwards, which is the little guest pavilion. Um, they decided that, you know, the house was primarily for themselves and their son. So that was why there were two bedrooms. But it's a three hour drive from Sydney. And so if friends and family did come to visit them, they were unlikely to drive up, have lunch, turn around and drive all the way back um, to Sydney for another three hours. So they decided it was probably a good idea to have a little guest pavilion with two bedrooms, two bathrooms and another water tank. Um, and it's an absolute mini me of the um, the main pavilion, essentially identical, just a smaller version. And lastly, just that image of um, what that might look like when it's finally complete. Thank you very much. Awesome, man. That was really fantastic. Uh, we really appreciate it. It was really awesome, you know, fantastic work. Beautiful to see it. Uh, really, uh, really love seeing the rigor in your work and seeing the, the quality of the build outcome. I just am always uh, completely blown away by, by the level of detail and level of precision that you get on your projects. It's really fantastic. Um, so thank you. Um, perhaps if you could unshare your screen, we could get you back on uh, back on the the show, just on the screen, so people can see you. But I thought in the meantime we might just talk a little bit about we've got about three hundred people online at any one time, and I've had a lot of requests from people over the last couple of days about taping these and providing them 
um, at a later date. And I've decided that we're not going to do that actually in the moment. I think one of the most interesting things about doing this is about having people sit in a single space, uh, albeit over the internet, but it's quite nice to be able to feel the sharing the space all at the same time rather than people watching it all independently. I like the live nature of it. So, um, so yeah, so we, we, we will probably not be doing that, but Ian, thank you very much. Um, really love uh, having, you, uh, having you. There's a couple of questions that came through. One of them was about um, the warehouse and was keeping the warehouse a council requirement or was that, a, was that something that you, the client wanted or you wanted or what was the strate strategy behind keeping it? It was a fundamental principle for both myself and the client. Um, it's a really important thing that we keep as many of these buildings as possible. In Sydney, we've lost too many of them that have been knocked down to build new apartment developments or have been unsympathetically converted to apartments. Um, in Melbourne, you know, they're much more sympathetic to these former industrial buildings and they have so many more of them and I'm, I'm always envious when I go to Melbourne and see how many they still have in Fitzroy and Collingwood and places like that. Um, and, you know, I live in a little warehouse myself. Um, so, you know, I have a, a real affinity for them. And, and just in terms of, you know, the environmental impacts of demolishing and rebuilding, I just, I can't um, support it. And my client loves warehouses here as i said had searched for six years to find this one the last thing he wanted to do was knock it down um, it is in a heritage conservation area so council was certainly not suggesting that we could knock it down um, you know i don't think um, they necessarily would have objected if we had decided to convert it into apartments but that was not what my client and myself had in mind um, but yeah, why, why knock down a perfectly sound building when um, they have inherent qualities that are really hard to achieve when building from scratch? You know, time uh, plays an enormously important part in architecture. You need to have buildings um, age over time to really understand, you know, what went before historically. And, um, you know, we always love going to places where there's buildings that are you know, thousands of years old. Uh, we in Sydney only have buildings which are, you know, uh, 150 odd years old, um, 200 at most. And uh, so any building like this um, in the inner city, I, I think, should absolutely be kept. We should not be knocking these down. Um, we should be removing some of the other ones that came later, which are very mediocre, and start again on those, but certainly not these ones. And so then, just kind of moving on from that yeah, as an idea, what so what Chu I think was asking on the on the question that coming through about what are the core values that does define your design approach? Like, how do, what do you do? What, how do you sit? Like, your 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 schemes are all incredibly rigorous, but what's what's behind that? What what's the kind of values that you're placing at the front of the project when you sit down and start? It's about the space that you're in. Um, it's you know it's very traditional architectural values about the quality of space. And you typically get the best spaces when they're very simple and people can read those spaces and more particularly feel those spaces when they're in them. If you get too complicated, create complex volumes, uh, complex plans, um, I, I feel uncomfortable in those spaces. Um, but what's really fundamental to how I work is that I like the understanding of the entire volume of a building to be coherent at any time. So cellular buildings are not really my thing. Uh, so in the warehouse, you know, I kept talking about wanting to see the entire volume. Uh, even when we had finished creating bedrooms and bathrooms, you could still see through that clear glazing to understand what the original form of the building was. It's the same with my own little warehouse where we had to put a bathroom in it, but the same concept was really developed in my warehouse where we have uh, a black bathroom with clear glazing above it, which allows you to read that ceiling. Um, in the house in Castle Cove, that idea that even though, again, you've got bedrooms and bathrooms, the sliding wall panels open up so that they bleed into each other. They become one space that just has these divisions in it, but you read 
more than one space at any one time. And so it's, um, it's that idea about space. And I find that if you have a very clear plan, very clear circulation, and you sort of culminate in a special space, you know, primarily the living spaces, which have extra height typically, and, and an enormous number of my houses and even some of my apartments have double height living spaces with mezzanines. And those spaces to me are the best because it's volume, which is so important to us. Mm, absolutely. Uh, so and that's, that's hard to achieve sometimes, you know, particularly with um, developers uh, mm. you know, wanting to maximize their return for floor area and you're wanting to cut a double height volume into a space. You know yourself how hard that is to achieve. And mm. uh, we did work very hard on a lot of apartment buildings to, to achieve that. And we did. So <clears> I'm, I'm very proud of that. It's going to be interesting what happens um, after the coronavirus lockdown and to see what effects that has on the housing desires of particularly in Sydney, I think, in terms of that ability to have bigger spaces, like more open spaces, outdoor spaces attached to apartments, but more of that next time. Um, there was a question, um, which I quite like this question, but someone asked for your top two books, architecture Ooh. books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's actually two. Um, one is, is Esther McCoy's um, book on Craig Elwood. Uh, Craig Elwood's always been one of my heroes. Uh, I suppose that he has a similar background to me, or I, I should say I have a similar background to him, uh, where I came from a building background. My father was a builder in New Zealand. I grew up on building sites. And then he, my father made me go into engineering uh, where I've always wanted to be an architect. So I've come via that same sort of building engineering background that Elwood did. Um, the difference is that I am actually a qualified architect. He was never, but he was still an incredible architect. Um, the other book is a book on Jose uh, Kudur, which uh, I bought, I think, back in about 1987, 88, um, from Lamella, um, the other great bookshop we used to have in Darlinghurst, um, many, many years ago, long since gone. And that book on Kudurk's work was so influential uh, on my career. Uh, I actually won a scholarship back in 1990 to travel and study um, his work in Barcelona and Girona. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time in Spain uh, seeking out all of his buildings and they are incredible. They are still incredible to this day. His Barcelona apartment building is one of my favorite apartment buildings in the world. Uh, his Ugalde house is um, incredible. And uh, his studio for the artist Tapis in the center of Barcelona was always uh, one of my favorite sort of live work spaces. So I think those two would be at the top of my list. Awesome, we might put them up on the website so that everyone can have a look at what they are. Um, just a couple of things to finish off before we say thank you. Uh, if you, if anyone wants to have a look at our website, we've actually got some special orders up at the moment. We are having challenges getting stock from um, Europe at the moment, given what's happening around us. But we have secured some special orders from some of our suppliers. So we've got some. We've kind of got a hit list of the best books. Uh, from the from the web from our from our perspective, so jump on, have a look. You can place an order for those. Um, just in terms of what's happening, uh, just to make sure, to we say hello also to all of our European watchers. We've got everyone in the UK and uh, pretty much all of Europe having breakfast at the moment, so uh, we've had a lot of emails about that. So thanks for watching. Um, we have coming up in the next couple of weeks. We've got. Jeremy McLeod from Breathe Architecture, Andrew Burns, uh, Philip Vivian, Camilla Bock, Block, uh, Sasha Coles. But next week we have Lee Hillam and Ashley Dunn from um, uh, Hillam and Dunn, or Dunn and Hillam Architects. And we have Andrew Burns from Andrew Burns Architects who will be talking next week. Uh, we'll continue to announce them. We are also uh, going to have one or two internationals. We've just confirmed the first one, an Irish architect who we'll announce in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be super exciting. But if there is anyone who you want to see, send us an email or uh, send us something on Instagram because it's the easiest way to get in touch with us. Uh, and we'll see, we'll reach out to them. We've got a few desires our, ourselves. We'd love to get Glenn Merkett on. So we'll see how we go with that. Um, and uh, I've asked Britt Anders Anderson today if she would do it. So we'll see whether we can get some of those people. But thanks, Ian. We really appreciate it. Um, really great to see you and to see the work. and. 
uh, to you know talk to you about what's going on and we appreciate you. You're a massive supporter of the bookshop, so again, we thank you for that. Um, but most importantly, we thank you for the contribution you make to the city of Sydney. It's a really amazing, your work's amazing and uh, you know, we can't speak highly enough of it. Thank you, thank you. My pleasure to be here. Awesome, thanks, we'll see you soon.